On this special Thanksgiving edition of the Power Play Show, Edwin Sumter has spent his career with the who's who in Boston entertainment, even spending time in a limo with Stevie Wonder. Well, this week, the entertainment journalist is on to discuss his latest project for the Music Museum of New England, a profile of Boston's own Elma Lewis, her life, her love, her contribution to the culture and arts of Boston, and why everyone should know her name. Edward Sumter is my guest next on The Power Play Show. From the studios at Hull Bay Productions, this is The Power Play. Welcome to the Power Play Show. I'm Tonya McGrath. I pray you are all having, enjoying your Thanksgiving holiday. My guest this week knows just about everything when it comes to art and culture in Boston. Born and raised, Edwin Sumter spent his career highlighting the who's who of Boston entertainment, from Donna Summer to Tracy Chapman. Edwin has interviewed some great names throughout his career. And this year, Edwin was offered an opportunity to write for the Music Museum of New England, where he has written profiles for the Cantab Lounge, Summer Thing, Maurice Starr, Tracy Chapman, Rob Zombie, and most recently, Donna Summer, one of the most popular profiles on the site. But it is his latest work that is near and dear to my heart and probably many other Bostonians. Edwin is writing the profile to the museum's newest inductee, Elma Lewis. Her impact on the Boston music scene may not be known by those outside of Boston, and even many in Boston may not realize what she has done. But today, Edwin will tell us why everyone should know about Emma Lewis. Edwin Sumter, welcome to the Power Play Show. Tanya, it is my pleasure so much to be here. Thank you very much to be on your show and to have this opportunity. And as you said, it's the opportunity not just to talk about myself, but all the wonderful people I've met and some I've had the chance to interview over the years and a couple of causes that are near and dear to me. And as I like to say, it's really funny because I'm really just a resident of the city of Boston. I'm not really represented by any organization or company or anything. Just a guy with a voice who loves his hometown, has seen his hometown do bad, do better, do good, do worse, but whatever the, whatever has happened, my issue is that we always can be better and the better Boston is, the better it is for all of us. Absolutely. I was so excited to see the news about you writing about Emma Lewis, but I do want to talk a little bit more about you and your work over the years and how you kind of got to this place. Absolutely. My, well, my story, the short and sweet of it is I'm born and raised in Dorchester, went to Boston public schools up until the sixth grade. The seventh grade, my mother got me in Medco. I spent the next six years in Marblehead, Massachusetts every day from Dorchester to Marblehead. Spent a couple years at Emerson College. I guess my first, and I've always liked, like most folks, I loved music and loved movies and all, but I met a gentleman named Fred Clark who, worked, who started a small newspaper called the Boston Greater News. And Fred was a one-man operation. I saw this newspaper and I just remember thinking one day, wow, this guy doesn't have anybody writing about music or movies. Well, let me just go in and offer my services. And he said, sure, I'll tell you what, you can actually have a byline as the entertainment editor of this newspaper. Wow. As a a 23-year-old who was fresh-faced and had never written an article before, that meant the world to me. I was writing these articles about entertainment in Boston, and I would always write, by Edwin Sumter, entertainment editor of the Boston Greater News. Although I was the only person <laughs> at the paper writing about entertainment. He was really the, the publisher and only other writer. But uh, it really gave me a good uh, feeling that I had a platform to work with. And then lo and behold, before I knew it, I was working in sales at WILD for the glorious the three glorious years from um, 86 to, to um, I'm sorry, 86 to 89. And those were the days with Elroy and Coach and Stephen Hill and Mike Shannon and Pebbles. We all know Pebbles, of course, from the various jobs she's had later. She was the intern then, uh, Candy Eastman, Rudy mm-hmm. Darden, just a great, great crew. And just giving such a great service to the community. And plus, I also wrote for the newspaper. So I was able to combine the two into whenever somebody came into town at WILD, I was able to approach them as the entertainment editor of this newspaper. (laughs) But I will say this, whether it was Donna Summer or Natalie Cole or Jesse Jackson or Barry White or Melissa Morgan or 
Marlon Jackson, they all said the same thing to me, no matter what. And that was, I'll be more than happy to help you since you're representing the black press. It was just us and the Bay State Banner, and we were nowhere as big as the banner. But they, it just meant the, the world to them that there was a voice trying to get the black press out there. I even got to interview Stevie Wonder through that newspaper. So it was covering those, covering the concerts that went on in town. And again, I was a one-man operation doing all of this. And I'll fast forward, by the time social media came around, I just parlayed it into about 2009, I started doing these little profiles called Really, Really Unsung. These are mm. things I made up. And Really, Really Unsungs were little profiles I was I was doing on not A-list or B-list, but really C-list actors. The, the faces you knew, the names you did. Like, for example, uh, Mama Jefferson from The Jeffersons. I mean, we right. all knew who she was, but did we know anything about her? Her name is Zoa Curry. Lo and behold, she's from Worcester, Massachusetts. Wow. Home girl. And she became, she became one of the oldest actors to ever become famous. She was in her 80s when she hit the Jeffersons and became such a star. And in fact, she was from Massachusetts. And if you don't mind, I always like, whenever I mention her name, I do want to say one other thing about her too was that really has stuck with me. And that is that she was one of the first fruits. I had never heard the expression before. The first fruits was that first generation of children born to, ex, the, the, born to former slaves. So after slavery ended, there were children born free, if you will. Mm. They were called first fruit. I love telling that story because I just feel that's such a great part of our history. And to know that that was the expression for the first generation of children who was quote unquote born free in America. They were called the first fruit. So, wow. it's, yeah, so it's through social media that next thing I knew one day I I used to get so encouraged by my Facebook friends because they followed my writing and they would say, Ed, you're doing a great job. And one day I wrote down, wrote in, I put in Facebook, wow, you guys, you make me feel like a writer. And uh, Harry Sandler, the executive director of the Music Museum of New England, sent me a note and said, Ed, you are a writer. Would you like to come write for us? And I've done six introduction to the uh, Hall of Fame with the Music Museum of New England. And you mentioned them. Donna Summer was the one that I just did, and that was so popular that I couldn't believe that her popularity, and all, well, I'll say it, even mine had reached the degree it did, with so many responses on Facebook. I was told- Oh, it was, it was great. It was it was a great and I really worked hard on that. And then when I, since I was sort of hot, or as hot as you can get with a website <laughs> like that, I went through the list of people in there, and I noticed that Elma Lewis was not in that Hall of Fame. Now, the Hall of Fame for the Music Museum of New England talks about music contributions, but lo and behold, I think no one can deny that Oma Lewis's impact on the Boston music scene was just as powerful as the thing she did on stage and dance. And thus, that is now the story I'm doing. Yeah, and the, and I was gonna say how it, how, it fall, had, how it had fallen into your lap that way, but as a Bostonian, you must share with me how you first came to know about Elma Lewis. Certainly. Now, and it's, it's great because as I'm writing this story, and I must say, it would take a novel, two novels, to write something that's fair and respectable enough for all Elma Lewis has done for the city of Boston and continues to do despite, despite the fact she's been gone almost 15 years. For me, it was Playhouse in the Park. I can remember as sure as I'm sitting here talking to you, my father loading myself, my two sisters and my mother into the car, going up to Franklin Park and seeing these performances on stage. And it's very important that I mention the first performances on stage I'd seen in my life. To see musicians come up and not just do one type of music. Sure, there was R&B and soul, but I'd never seen African dance perform. I'd never seen the spoken word perform. So much went on up at Playhouse in the Park. And then as you get older, you realize this is all spawned from the Elma Lewis School of Arts. Mm -hmm. This incredible woman has this institution right here in the city, right here in Boston, right here in Roxbury, right here that has got so many young people who I don't know where else they could have possibly gone in the numbers they went to play the piano, to learn how to read music or to, to do uh, acting or to be in a band, or have the, or even have, and I think this is something else Elma Lewis should get an enormous amount of credit for. You know, Elma, Elma Lewis showed that it could be done. I, I think that the things that kids might have thought of as a dream 
to her became a reality if you just took the chance and met her because you'd meet other kids who had the same dream. Suddenly you weren't alone and that was something. Emma Lewis, from what I understand, was a disciplinarian <laughs> and she made sure, but I always felt that what I've read and what I've heard, the disciplinary part of Emma Lewis just wasn't for you to do what she said. She wanted you to do what you knew you could do. Mm. It was inside you. It was inside you. And now there are thousands of people around the world who can trace their roots back to either Elma or knowing someone who worked with Elma. I, I am a indeed a product of the Elma Lewis School <laughs> of Performing <laughs> Arts and my mom was a former teacher uh, wow. of art yeah. at the Elma Lewis School of Performing yeah. Art. Yeah. And I don't think that we appreciated as much back then how important it was to see someone who looked like us teaching Absolutely. us these cultural things. Like you probably saw them in other cities where there yeah. was a, a larger African-American community, but to have that right there on Humboldt Ave in Absolutely. Roxbury um, and all these kids from all walks of life uh, being in that building, I, I, I still remember it. I remember the building being very cold, yeah. um, <laughs> but I still remember it. and. You know, I wonder how much people can really appreciate what that meant in the Boston. What What do you think about that? Like, how- that's a that's a great point, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what, what what I mean. You know, once I started researching this piece on Elma Lewis, I real I started to occur to me, wow, nobody really mentions Elma Lewis. I, I really was a little surprised, even myself, that her name doesn't come up a little bit more. And as you know, and we all know, time goes on so fast that pieces of history can be left behind. They can't be forgotten. But if they're not put in the lexicon of what's going on in society, suddenly before you know it, five years turns into 10, 10 years into 15, where nobody's mentioned or done anything regarding the work of this person. And I'm certainly not saying that this profile I'm doing, Alma Lewis, is going to rekindle uh, you know, what the kind of uh, endorsement and recognition she deserves, not just in Boston, but in New England. But it is putting it back on the map. It's getting it out there. If my Facebook friends and social media friends who enjoy Donna Summer, it, what, for some of them, they may read about Elma Lewis and say, oh my God, I haven't thought about Elma Lewis in a while. I got to keep her, my, her out there. I'm always, I always like to mention to my friends on social media, if you read something I write, read it to your kids. Mm-hmm. You know, we let them know who this person was, who lived right down the street, who did all of this right in the city. Uh, and and then, of course, for folks my age, it's if I could come up with a little nugget or something that people didn't know about, for example, uh, as much as I love music, I think I know music. It wasn't until I started this research at Elma Lewis that I didn't know that in 1969, there was a concert at Harvard Stadium to raise funds for her school headlined by Sly the Family Stone and Rosa Pickett. Really? That is a huge, huge That's event. That's a huge deal. That's I didn't huge. know that either. And I, I spoke to somebody just the other night who was at that show. And again, this is 1969, Sly and the Family Stone and Wilson Pickett. They were at the top of their game. Sly and the Family Stone, it just didn't, I'm just done Woodstock, you know, earlier that year. So uh, to have that kind of power back then to come into Boston, there's a true contribution to the music scene a concert like that. And then so much more, bringing the Boston Pops into Boston and Boston Ballet performing at uh, at Plows in the Park. And then of course, bringing her dancers and her entertainers into different parts of the city of Boston. You know, it's so wonderful that she was breaking down these doors and opening up these, you know, breaking down these barriers so everybody could enjoy what's important. And then, you, you know, Black Nativity is probably the only time during the year where occasionally I might hear Elma's name mentioned Miss Lewis's thing mentioned is around Black Nativity, but uh, she deserves to be out there a lot more. And again, I just think it's a situation where people just need to um, tell their stories, read something about Miss Lewis, and pass it on. We need to take a quick break more with Edward Sumter when we return. You're listening to The Power Play Show. Art is not separate from life. Art is not something to be added to the people. Art is the guts of the people. Hey, everybody. 
everybody. This is Alicia Roofs, one of the five women featured in the upcoming documentary, More Than Our Skin, a film about living with vitiligo. I'm excited to share the kickoff of our raffle event now through November 30th. We have four giveaways to offer with all proceeds going to the production of this film. For more information on the contest and the prizes, visit morethanourskin.org slash raffle. Great prizes for a great cause. You don't want to miss this. Welcome back to the Power Play Show with my guest, Edwin Sumter. Edwin, talk about the cultural impact Miss Lewis had, not just in Boston, but outside of Boston. Absolutely. You know, Elma, uh, when her parents uh, came here to Boston, uh, incredibly in 1921, uh, when they gave birth to Elma, well, when Elma was born, they hadn't gone through on, in the Bahamas the kind of uh, prejudice that they were going to receive here in Boston and in America in general. But they were prepared. I mean, they knew that America was an entirely different situation from living in the Caribbean. But they had a power source, and that was they were disciples of Marcus Garvey. And they were disciples of his philosophy of self-reliance and just forging ahead. Alma's mother used to make her sweep the steps of their home in Roxbury every other day. And she, oh. would, say to her, and she would say to her, you're not just sweeping the steps to keep our home nice and beautiful. You're doing it for the neighborhood as well. And that must have, and I'm sure that helped foster in Elma's attitude towards what can she do for her community. Elma would go on to Emerson College. She'd also go to BU. And it's almost interesting that she would be at the School of Teaching and also arts through Emerson College and put the two together and end up, and, and end up teaching the arts. So with the $300 she borrowed from her dad, she started this little school. She had two secondhand pianos. She had a very cold dance hall, some folding chairs, but the kids came in by the dozens. Yeah. I mean, they, they came right in. Sure, she was the only one in the community doing it, and she but she knew how to lure them in with the opportunity to express yourself through song, through dance, through music. And at the same time, and I think being a strict disciplinarian was also very good because in other words, you were here to enjoy these things, but it was also serious serious because you were only going to find out how good you were if you were really, for lack of a better word, sort of forced to find out how good you were. Right. And, and that's something that, I, from what I've spoken to people, she did it back in 1940. She carried it right through into the 1980s. She was tough, but she was tough because she wanted you to do and be all you can be. And, uh, she, she really did. And, you know, she was a woman with a small stature yeah. and but a booming voice like we knew when Miss Lewis was in the building. <laughs> but, you know, I, I remember that some, it, you know, when we later on in the years, she got a lot of flack about that, that maybe perhaps she was too hard on people. Are you hearing that in your research about her? I like, well, you know, I'm saying disciplinarian because I, I've heard some stories where you know, she was she was really really tough I did find a couple quotes from her that I found very interesting for example she you know she would say that as her life went on it was obvious she had no children of her own but she's quick to say she has thousands of children and I think that about says she was tough like a parent is on a child even though you all if I may and others weren't her own children. She loved everyone, but she was tough like a parent. So I can understand how, since she really wasn't your mother, really wasn't your aunt, really wasn't your grandmother, she was maybe a little tough. But I think in the end, especially, it's sad to say that in our community where there were so many things kids didn't have, you probably did need, and especially when, and again, with music, dance, and theater, there's a chance there to go so many different ways. Somebody had to keep everybody sort of lined up focused on what was going on and the fact that this small woman was doing that I, I tend to cut you know cut us some slack on being again again I wasn't in her classroom so right <laughs> yeah no if, if she caught you chewing say. gum yeah, yeah, uh, yeah if she caught you running and you weren't supposed yeah, we to be running if you were somewhere where you weren't supposed to be yeah you you got a tongue lashing absolutely <laughs> and my mom being a teacher in the school did not <laughs> save <laughs> me at all 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I so but again it's I guess in the end this is one of those where the ends justify the means because look at all that Elma Lewis continues to inspire and as I mentioned earlier the now the kids of the kids of the kids who are affiliated with Elma Lewis are still in the uh, the, the in the arts. And, and that's the greatest testimony that anyone could could, could give to Elma Lewis. And, I, and many folks do reach back and, and do mention that their beginnings became where they or their mothers so forth began. But I think the entire Lewis, Elma Lewis story, you know, again, I'm not even talking about the fact what an activist she was, you know, for, you know, for, for the black community or, or, make, or her theater and dance, how she combined all of that under one roof. It was, you know, so it might've been a dance school, it might've been a music school, it might've been a theater school. She was trying to do it all under one roof, which is quite exceptional. It was, it was. And it wasn't just young girls. There right. were as many young boys in that school as there were girls. I remember that very, very clearly. And the other thing that resonated that I remember is that you saw parents so involved in yes. what was happening at the school. Um, yeah. They were invested in not just Elma Lewis, but all the children that were going to the performing arts school. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I think throughout the decades, we've kind of lost that a little bit. Yes. Um, but that, that also spoke to just how much her people respected her, particularly in the community. Absolutely. It's so funny you should mention the thing about the boys. I'm going to read a quote that I uh, got from the it's called the History Makers. That's an African-American society that records the oral history of great African-American figures. This is a direct quote from Alma Lewis. We were overrun with students. For one thing, I didn't accept money from boys because I wanted boys. As traditional, black people educated girls and let the boys rough it. But I couldn't see how that could be successful. So I wanted the boys and developed the boys. People would always say, You've got so many boys. I would just smile. They didn't know that with the boys, I got something for nothing. And those boys are still in my life today. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. That's I was, incredible. Yes, yeah, I was so floored by when I saw that quote. Yeah. So she let the boys in for nearly nothing, just so there had to be boys to accompany the women, of course, with the dance and so forth. But she also wanted to make sure that that was one way it was hard for the boys not to get in because boys might say, dance, I don't know, I don't know. Right. Parents could say, hey, it's free, you're going. Yes, absolutely. So, again, there's the mind of Alma Lewis. <laughs> One of her signature performance pieces, which you mentioned a little bit earlier, was of course the production of Black Nativity, absolutely. which I was in as a young girl. My sister like was in it as well. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to say it's still in production. I can't wait to bring my granddaughter to go see it this year. But I wonder, it, it, are you in your research? Are you finding is this was this kind of a one of its kind performance piece like this, where it Absolutely. was an all African American uh, cast, and it was it was based on the birth of of Jesus, and it was just I mean I I still remember the songs to this day. I, I just I love Black Nativity. When you when you talk about Black Nativity, Langston Hughes is classic, of course. One thing again in this research is another reason why I love writing and I want to stay right here. If you're interested in writing, one of the best parts about writing is researching because I did not know that the first performances of um, um, Black Nativity were directed by Elma Lewis. She actually directed the first <laughs> several uh, several uh, Christmases, Christmas performances again. And it had, just like we were saying, you can imagine the level of expertise she wanted during those first five or six years where she directed that show herself, which meant consequently, when she stepped down from directing, whoever stepped into that chair knew they had a bar they had to stick with. They had to put that show on. So I'm saying that to say that the show today, and it looks like I'm not quite sure if we've got it coming up this year with, with uh, Corona and all, but when I did see it two years ago, I was wondering then, wow, is it at the same level that I bet it was back in the 1950s when she started it? And I'm sure it is. It, it's a fabulous piece, it's an all black production, and it remains something today that is truly one of the traditions of Boston. It's run at theaters in the Boston Theater District, run for weeks, sells yes. out for weeks. 
It yeah, is a, and the tickets are pretty expensive are this pretty, year. <laughs> pretty expensive. So it is truly a testament to Elma Lewis that here we are, one of the biggest holiday uh, treats or holiday must-dos in the city of Boston is to go see uh, Native, uh, Native uh, Black, Black, Black Activity, is to go see Black Activity. So I'm sure that, that she is smiling down on that, that it is still going strong all these years later. Yeah, and I was in one of those early productions that she wow. was directing. And if yeah. you were not on the right foot, oh, go oh, tell it on the right mountain right. coming down those things. Yeah. Or yeah. You, you were getting pulled out of the line. Oh, no. You were getting screamed <laughs> at. And then you go back in the line and you keep you keep it right. You know, I, I, I think that what is, you know, my, my children know about Black Nativity because, of course, I took them and I, I'm going to have my granddaughter, who's three, and I'm going to share this with her as well. But I, I, I get a little sad thinking that there is a whole generation or generations of people in Boston who don't know who Elma Lewis is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as I mentioned, you know, she's only been gone 15 years. It feels like it's been a lot longer than that because it's almost like you really don't care much about her. I know that a play in the park is still going on and still going strong during summer, during the summer, but it just seems as if uh, Elma Lewis' name may be attached to it, but we've got a whole generation just seeing the name like they're seeing the words play in the park. They don't know the person behind the, uh, behind the name and all she did. Well, how play in the park? started how she took some of her students up to Franklin Park and cleared out that area and put that stage up. I mean, it just all didn't just happen. It happened through the mind and the hands and the, and the fortitude of this small woman to keep performance, bring performance into our neighborhood. You know, Franklin Park is much as into our neighborhood as Nubian Square. It's really part of our neighborhood. Yes. And it's through, it's through Playhouse in the Park that it remains that way. And it does today, but I just think that Alma Lewis's name, as you just mentioned, it should be more than just attached to it. People need to know, you know, who she is. And hopefully, maybe this is an idea for whoever, you know, there needs to be a booklet or something handed out, you know, maybe or someone take to the stage and, and just say, you know, who Alma Lewis. Or maybe they Xerox your profile or piece maybe they and they Xerox hand that stuff. out. <laughs> <laughs> we need to take another quick break. More with Edwin Sumter in a moment. You're listening to The Power Play Show. Some people play, create some things which are really junk, but they have a lot of color <laughs> and a lot of caricature. And they say it's black art. Now, what I want to see, as the voice spoke of, the souls of black folks. The souls. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tony McGrath, producer and director of the upcoming film project, More Than Our Skin. I decided to make this film because I saw a need to let the stories of those living with vitiligo be heard. That it's more than the spots you see. It's the feelings, the depression, the community, and the lives of those impacted by an autoimmune disease with no known cure. More Than Our Skin plans to tell the stories of a diverse cast of people who are willing to share their journeys, many for the first time, as they make positive steps to bring understanding, inclusivity, and acceptance to this widely misunderstood disease. It is my hope that this film will change lives, not just for those with vitiligo, but for the wider audience who will understand once and for all that it's more than our skin. Thank you. Welcome back to the Power Play Show. My guest, Edwin Sumter. Edwin, you've had the opportunity to sit down with some heavy hitters in the entertainment industry. Anyone stick out more for you as just completely unforgettable? Absolutely. I've got a couple great stories to tell. Uh, <laughs> back in the 1980s, and this is the best interview slash time I've ever had with any celebrity, the late, great Barry White. We were doing a, an event at WILD. It was called Breakfast with Barry. And I wish I could remember what restaurant it was that supplied the breakfast. But breakfast was served and 15 lucky callers would call throughout the week, came down to WILD, and Barry White was in town 
So they got to meet Barry and yes, have breakfast with Barry White. So at the same time, I wanted an interview with Barry White. Elroy R.C. Smith was nice enough to let me use his office to interview Barry White. So I go into this office and Barry comes in with I think maybe his second plate. <laughs> and Barry's sitting across from me and we're doing an interview and I'm as calm as I can be sitting across from a man who sold 100 million records. And in the middle of the interview, I mentioned to him that I grew up in a neighborhood where the matriarchal family, if you will, for the whole neighborhood was the Webster family. And the, the father of this family loved Barry White. In fact, whenever we went out to Franklin Park to play baseball or something, all we would play, all he would play is Barry White and Johnny Taylor. That was it. So we had to get our own boombox if we want to hear something else. <laughs> and his wife especially loved Barry White. So I'm telling Barry this story. Then in the middle of it, I say, boy, would she get a kick out of it if I could call her right now and tell her I was speaking to you. And on a dime, he said, go ahead, Edward, give her a call. Wow, that's picked awesome. Up the phone, picked up the phone, dialed the number. They used to call me Fast Daddy back then. So the phone <laughs> rang, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. She picks up the phone. I said, hi, Miss Webster, this is Eddie. She says, Fast Eddie, what are you doing? Call me at in the morning. I said, oh, I have somebody who wants to say hello to you. I hand the phone to Barry White. Barry says, Hi, Minnie, this is Barry White. <laughs> he starts yelling and screaming so loud I could hear her through the phone. Oh, my goodness. The other part is he's talked to her, to her for like three minutes. I heard you and your husband like my music. And, that, and, and he talked to her like two or three minutes. And I got to tell you, it was such a nice thing to do, such an original thing to do in such a great moment. The postscript to that is she has three sons who I'm still friends with today. And when I went home that evening and walked around a corner to hear what they had to say. They just applauded. They just applauded for me doing that for their mom. So that's one of my favorite stories. My second one is when I interviewed Stevie Wonder. This one is like one other planet. Stevie Wonder was in town to do a few concerts, a concert on the Commons. He already announced he was coming in and not doing any interviews. But being true to who Stevie Wonder is, he agreed to call into WILD on a Saturday because he had a relationship with the radio station. Of course, he wanted to support WILD. I was working there at the time and didn't even know he was going to call in. So I'm driving down Warren Street just by happenstance on a Saturday when Rudy Darton, who's on the air, says, we'll be right back. And, Barry, and, and Stevie Wonder will be calling in. I couldn't believe it. I slammed on my brakes. I ran into the station. I ran upstairs into the radio room. And I said, Rudy, is Stevie really calling? And he said, yeah, we didn't want to tell a lot of people. He's calling in. So I sat right there while he interviewed Stevie Wonder. When they went to commercial break, I said, can I just say hi to him? So he said, go ahead. So once he said that, that was a mistake because I went into the whole thing. My name is Ed Sumter. I work for the Boston Radio News. It's one of the few black on papers in all of Massachusetts. I work at WLD. I'd love this. I spoke so fast. Stevie wanted to say, oh, slow down, brother. Slow down. Let me let you speak to my man. So he put his manager on the phone and the guy said, we're going to be at the Page Academy in Roxbury in about an hour and a half. And if you come up there, I'll give you a couple of minutes with Stevie Wonder. Ah, wow. Ran down, so I ran downstairs jumped in my car, went over to Anubian Notion to get some batteries for my tape recorder, went into Anubian Notion, came out to my car, I locked my keys in the car. Ah, oh, what? <laughs> Ran across the street to the police station. First policeman looked at me like I was crazy, wouldn't even help me, but the second policeman said, you got this chance right now? He grabbed a Slim Jim, went to my car, opened up my car, I zipped up to the hill to the Page Academy, I sat in front of there, and lo and behold, about 45 minutes later, two limousines pulled around the corner. Stevie Wonder got out. They had a program all set up. He went inside the Page Academy, brought a little keyboard with him, sang songs like, I just called to say, I love you. Play the songs with the kid. I found the man who told me to uh, give me a couple of minutes with Stevie Wonder. He said, oh, you're at something, I'll tell you what. Get in the limousine. I'm going to bring Stevie to sit in the limousine with you for five minutes. And sure enough, I'm sitting in that limousine, Sweating, couldn't believe it. The door opens, Stevie Wonder comes in, takes my hand and holds my hand during a five minute interview with what? Stevie Wonder. Wow. That's asked him about making music, how does he do it? And at the time there was a rumor he was running for a mayor of Detroit, mm -hmm. asked him about that. And he held my hand during it, because I guess what Steve, that's what Stevie did. And I just told him you know, what an what a honor it was and everything. And I had a little tape recorder running with me and that remains one, those two, Barry and Stevie, there are a few others. The only one I would rather mention is when I met Natalie Cole. That's the only time I was really nervous. And that's because of what her father meant to my parents. My parents loved Nat King Cole. I know every Nat King Cole song because my dad played every Nat King Cole song. So for some reason, when I got to meet Natalie Cole, 
I felt like I was meeting royalty. She calmed me down by saying, I can see you're a little nervous, but I'm a UMass girl. She went to the University of Mass. And that made me laugh, broke the ice, and I was able to talk to her. And that, that's that's just a few of a, a couple. And I, fortunately, I took cameras with me for a lot of these interviews, so I got some great pictures. You know, it's, um, and you, you mentioned WILD, yeah. and it, which was really a cultural oh, institution yeah. in Boston. And I was so sad when it went away. And um, because all the who's who of entertainment, sure. they all went through WILD. They, they all did. And, you know, now we fast forward and in 2021, and what we're seeing is a real lack of black music or right. just cultural music at all and in that's Boston. Really what it is. It's and, the you, and you spoke out about it. I did. And you know, it's funny, I, I really had linked the, the dearth of black music representation in Boston is one thing, but as you just mentioned, it's that when those artists came through WILD, I'm not saying they came through with a black agenda, but there was a black culture. There was, they came in as black artists, they were at a black radio station. So obviously there was a sense of feeling of togetherness and unity that's a little different to today. When the artists come through uh, Boston today and visit the radio stations, the issues that the artists would bring in in the 80s and 90s, for example, don't get mentioned on the radio stations today because the radio stations really aren't you know, black neighborhood radio stations. So they may have uh, people of color doing the shows, but they're not going to bring up the issues that are going on in the community because the radio stations aren't geared that way. Regarding the Boston Red Sox situation, five years ago, I noticed that of all the concerts in the common, a concert at Fenway Park, like Fenway Park has summer concerts between the months of June and October. And they have about seven or eight, nine a year. They started these concerts in 2003. In 2016, I noticed they had done about 60, 70 shows. And I just started wondering how many of those shows have been headlined, again, headlined by a person of color? Mm -hmm. The answer then was zero. It is now 19 years and 91 concerts. Now, when I speak to young people, not just young people, people my age and the community of Boston, which is 55% people of color. Most people don't even realize this concert's going on at Fenway Park. But everybody's stunned to hear this, that in 19 years and 91 concerts in a city that is 55% people of color, how many of those shows have been headlined by a person of color? Zero. Mm. Zero. Now, the little exception is that Jay-Z did co-headline with Justin Timberlake right. in 2013. But in terms of a single person of color headlining one show out of 91 shows at Fenway Park. And again, this is not like where the Patriots play in Foxborough. Fenway Park can be walked to by just about anybody who lives in Boston. That's it is right. truly a neighborhood ballpark. Yet somehow, the Boston Red Sox, Live Nation, and those who put on those concerts have not been able to find one color, one person of color to headline one of those shows in 19 years. Mm. Now, where does the blame go? Well, when I first started this out, of course, I was through the roof. It's their fault. How dare they do this? So forth and so on. But after five years of trying to get some attention towards this issue, I just don't blame the Red Sox or Live Nation or anybody, I, I, or just them. I blame the powers that be in the city of Boston to allow this to happen. Um, we have far too many young people, and not just black black and brown and, or yellow and white. We have far too many people in the city who should feel invited. They should have a reason to feel invited to go to Fenway Park. Now, when people say to me, oh, what does Fenway Park have to owe? They don't owe you guys anything. Then why would they put a Black Lives Banner as long as they could on the outside of Fenway Park? Right, right. It's double talk. It's Black Lives Matter on the outside, but getting or letting or get, inviting Black, Brown lives inside Fenway Park, it's a whole different story. And I just don't think it's fair. I just don't think it's fair. One politician recently said to me, you know, Ed, in the end, you're right. It's a shame that so many black and brown kids in this city have never seen the green grass of Fenway Park. 
concert for a baseball game. And that's true. Because in my opinion, and I'll end with this, I'll say this. We just had a mayoral race where the sitting mayor said her vision of Boston was all inclusive. The two women in the finalists, the finals, both said that their vision of Boston was an all inclusive Boston. Well, I say this if you go to San Francisco, you gotta go to the Golden Gate, Golden Gate Bridge. Then you feel like you've been in San Francisco. You go to Washington, D.C., you gotta go by the White House to stand there. Then you've been in Washington, D.C. You go to New York, you better hit Times Square, Empire State Building. Then you feel like you've been in New York. If you come to Boston, Massachusetts, you have got to understand that Fenway Park and Lansdowne Street is our number one tourist attraction. Yes. Because halfway around the world, people know the Boston Red Sox at Fenway Park. So if you want to have an all-inclusive Boston, how can you say we are anywhere near an all-inclusive Boston if our number one tourist attraction is the least inclusive place in all of Boston? It's That's just so double talk. It's so true. It's so true. The Power Play show ends with asking our guests three quick questions. And my first one to you is, when it comes to the power of Elma Lewis's cultural impact on the city, how would you rate it? In the city, I would say Elma Lewis, for what she did, I'd give her a 10, and I'll tell you why. I imagine Boston without Elma Lewis. If Elma Lewis didn't do what she did, especially in the 50s and 60s, with the school that turned into the 70s, I don't even have a close second as to who else could have done it. Elmer Lewis and Tenneco still, still go around the world. If it, if it, it's almost as if, if it wasn't her, there would have been no one else. I shudder to think, what if there was not an Elmer Lewis? I would have given it an eight or a nine because I could have said, well, if we didn't have Elmer Lewis, maybe this would have happened. There is no maybe other. I mean, I can't come up with any other anything close to what Elma Lewis did. I mentioned the Boston Pops coming into into Boston. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Elma Lewis bringing her performances downtown to um, City Hall Plaza. I'm talking about the uh, Boston, Boston Ballet coming into the community. Her taking her dances all around Boston and New England. She did as much as anyone could do to expose everybody to all types of music and also bring all types of music to the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. My second question to you is, why is it important that we teach our young people about Elma Lewis? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I've got to tell you, it's also, a, in a way, a, a painful question because time is, goes on so fast now. And with how fast the world is today, it's easy to see how she may have been gotten a little lost in the shuffle. Mm, yeah. If, if, if she's not there... If there's not a lot of video, if there's not a lot of uh, uh, footage, I mean, and again, I don't mean to say kids, and I shouldn't just say kids, but it's like anything else. If you can't see it, it's almost as if it didn't happen. So it's important for us, and you're doing it yourself. You, you're being a granddaughter to Black Nativity. So she'll get to see what it is able to see, and of course, hear the stories that you've got to share. And that's something we all need to do. It's important because, as an old adage goes, you really can't get to point B if you don't really know what happened at point A. And Oma Lewis was point A. Yes, she was. Last question, what would be the one word you would use to describe Emma Lewis? Vision. Mm. Vision. My opening, my opening, I think, I think it's so funny you should ask that question. I believe the word vision is in my second, uh, my second sentence in my opening paragraph vision. When her mother had her wipe those steps when Emma was a little girl and say to her, you're not just doing this for our house, our student, but you're doing it for the community. I, I just had the sense that Emma's vision went from in front of these steps to what she could do for the whole neighborhood. Yeah. You know, and that's vision. And that's vision. So I could have picked a lot of work, but I just think there's something about her vision. And, you know, the other thing that always moves me is that she didn't have kids of her own, but she said, I have thousands of kids. Hey, I'm one of them. And you're one of them. <laughs> I'm one of them. And you're one of them. <laughs> Edwin Sumter, thank you so much for being my guest today. We will have the link to your profile on Emma Lewis available on our website. And I urge you all, if you haven't heard of Elma Lewis, and even if you have, 
read it, share it with your kids, share it with your family. It's that important that you remember this incredible Bostonian uh, an icon in so many ways. Edwin, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you all so much. You can catch the article hopefully in about a week on the Music Museum of New England website. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me on the show. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. All your secret stuff is there to take you somewhere. And if you change according to what other people would do, you're not going to do anything worthwhile. I hear so many young people say today, or the other, I want to have a house like Bill Cosby. Why should anybody want to have a house like anybody? I'll come over to your house to visit. I'm oh, yeah. proud of you for having it. That's one of the reasons I stayed here. That's largely asked of me by taxi drivers and other people. Why do you still live there? This is a good house. And I also, if I want to talk to Ted Kennedy, this is where my office is. I don't know where his is. I'm at the end of the road. And it pleases me to hear her grandchildren say, and that her great-grandchildren say, we're keeping this house. I have had remarkable success with my students. Remember, you can listen to past episodes of the Power Play Show wherever you subscribe to podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Pandora Podcasts, and now Amazon Music. You can also watch our interviews on YouTube. Simply search the Whole Bay Productions media channel and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we air each Saturday at 5 p.m. on BroncoiRadio.com. So be sure to tune into the Power Play Show each Thursday for a new episode wherever you subscribe to podcasts or watch us on our YouTube channel at the Whole Bay Productions media channel or simply visit thepowerplayshow.com. Until next time, I'm your host, Tonya McGrath. Be well, and I hope you are all enjoying your time this Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving.